Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's session, State of the States, the Open Education Initiatives in the Time of COVID. My name is Tanya Gross and I'm the Director of Educational Programming at OTN. Sarah Cohen, the Managing Director of OTN, will be facilitating today's session and will be assisted by Barb Thies, the Community Manager, as well as the rest of our team who are all here. If you're not familiar with the Open Textbook Network, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open ed. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu forward slash OTN. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few important details with you. The hashtag for the summit today is hashtag OTN Summit 20. We are live tweeting our session, so please join us on Twitter at, at open underscore textbooks. This webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you have been muted. The video and transcriptions will be posted on the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. The last several minutes of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu forward slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah. Welcome. Thank you so much, Tanya, and hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation on the state of open education in the time of COVID from a statewide perspective. Um, I'm delighted to welcome today's panelists. Um, today, I am joined by Robert Awkward, um, who is from the, hi Bob, from the Department of um, Massachusetts, or pardon me, from the state of Massachusetts, uh, the Department of Learning and Outcomes Assessment. I'm also joined by Spencer Ellis, Director of Educational Innovation from the Colorado Department of Higher Education, and also joined by Terry Galloway, Executive Director and Associate Commissioner for Lewis, the Louisiana Library um, Network, um, and the Louisiana Board of Regents. Thank you to the three of you for joining us today. Before we begin, um, oh, pardon me. Before we begin, I did want to uh, set the stage a bit um, for the context for today's session. For those of you that joined us at our kickoff last week, um, we talked about, um, and as we all know, that COVID has upended many of the commonly held assumption, assumptions in higher education. This is a time of incredible uncertainty um, for our communities, for our health and safety, for campus operations, for enrollment retention and completion, for pedagogy, and for our budgets. The impact of any or all of these on open education is still new, but also likely and real. In some ways, the case for open education has never been clearer. However, making that case is all the more challenging. Today, we've asked Bob, Spencer, and Terry to share their perspectives with us as they navigate uncertainty at the state level. And I appreciate their willingness to give us a peek into what they are seeing, the conversations that they are having, and the way that they are thinking about this new world. However, we want to be clear with you, our audience, this is not a session about answers. At the OTN, one of the ways our community deals with uncertainty is surfacing the questions and challenges we are facing to better understand them and overcome them together. To that end, I'll be sharing a series of questions with our panelists, and I hope we'll have time for some of your questions closer to the end of the session. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask my three panelists to please unmute themselves so that we can begin um, with the first, uh, first question for you. Um, I'm going to start with Bob. Um, Bob, I'm hoping you could speak a bit to, in what ways are you adapting your open education strategy in the COVID era? Uh, thank you, Sarah. 
Um, I uh, first want to thank everybody for signing up for this today and coming to the session. Uh, I too have been enjoying the uh, open education network sessions uh, last week and in this week. So I'm glad to be a participant at the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. Um, we are, we quite frankly see as challenging as this time is for COVID, we see this as a um, opportunity, quite frankly, that faculty's need for uh, engaging robust learning materials combined with the fact that everyone is going to be doing a lot more online for the foreseeable future, plus the need to increase student success have created a perfect storm. And so in that, that has created, I think, both a need and an opportunity. In fact, the uh, BC campus uh, has a great uh, slide that they put out uh, talking about the issues of addressing OER during the period of COVID. And they make five great points in it. They, they talk about how it saves instructors time and money during this time, which indeed I believe it does, because you don't have to get permission to use the access easy, circulate the materials to students. It clearly saves our students, our cash strapped students money during this period. Uh, it's ideal from working from home since OER exists well in the online environment. It grants freedom in a time of constraints of which the constraints are many and going to probably get even more challenging over the next months ahead. And it's a way of helping to fight isolation, which we are probably all feeling right now, uh, because you know through the use of open pedagogy, students can be invited to participate and help uh, create the content in their courses. So as challenging as this period is, and it is, we see it as an opportunity in Massachusetts. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, Spencer or Terry, would either of you like to add anything there? Sure, sure. Uh, you hear me okay? Yes, thanks, Terry. Great. So um, in Louisiana, we've had a large focus in prior years on affordability as the key reason why we've been pursuing OER or the um, the main thing that we promote OER as a solution is related to affordability. And it's been the headline of how we framed our assessment of what we were doing, as well as how we talked about our success. So as we've gathered information from our campuses about the impact of the digital divide on the continuation of courses during this time, We've had a chance to look at OER more closely. Um, and as Bob has mentioned, we're certainly still looking at how OER addresses affordability, but there's this appetite and impetus to look at how OER supports those faster shifts to online education and more widespread attention, I believe, to how we're supporting universal design. Um, and like you mentioned in the beginning, it, it is, there's a lot of uncertainty and we don't have all the answers um, about the fall in particular. My personal strategy is just to try and be adaptable to the campus and the student needs as we see them develop. Um, try to understand what's happening on the ground. Do I see campuses making quick shifts to inclusive access as a resp uh, response to access issues, for example? So that's the type of area where, in terms of strategy, I would want to be monitoring what is happening. Um, we also know a lot of funding is going to be pushed out to states and campuses to support technology infrastructure. So again, carefully monitoring those opportunities for alignment with our OER priorities. So for example, We've collected data from our campuses on the impacts of inadequate hardware and Wi-Fi, as well as how access to course materials is critical. And issues have cropped up like LMS and courseware being difficult for students to use when they're attempting to complete courses on their cell phones with limited data plans. So 
highlighting features about the ability to download OER course materials and access them offline is kind of a differentiating strategy right now, where in the past, I felt like we were um, answering how OER was not part of the digital divide due to the digital nature of many OER and it being a possible deterrent. Now the digital format and possible portability could certainly be perceived and promoted as a solution in online education. Thanks, Terry Spencer. Thanks, Terry and Bob and Sarah. It's so exciting to be here. Um, just to pick up on a few themes that I think the, the first two presenters mentioned. So with uncertainty comes on opportunity. Right. People are more likely to be open to different ideas. And for me, this is really, really exciting because I haven't been working in higher ed for decades on decades. But I understand that we have been facing the same issues and beating our heads against the wall for a long, long time. And so I get really excited about open education because I think that open education has a role to play. Right. Education as a whole has a role to play in in designing new systems that more efficiently and better serve the people that we mean to serve. So um, things that we've been doing in Colorado, we've been revisiting the question that we've been asking ourselves since the beginning of this program, which is what role does open ed and OER play in helping our agency meet the educational goals of the state? That can be answered in many different ways, so I won't go down, <clears throat> won't go down that path, but that's one thing that we're really constantly asking ourselves. And then the other thing that I would note is there's a fine line between um, reactiveness and agility. And I think open education is more agile than reactive. Um, reactiveness to me has this connotation of shiny new object, right? We're chasing down some of these things that kind of pipe dreams, so to speak. Uh, but agility has, is really where the potential of open education lies, in my opinion. And I think that um, through a lot of the things that both of the first two presenters mentioned, we can be the engine that powers the responsive systems that better serve the learners that we want to serve. So open education presents so many opportunities in terms of access, in terms of approaches to open pedagogy, uh, equity, all these things that we're talking about. And so for us, it's really just to establish this infrastructure in our state so that our educators, the experts, can leverage those opportunities, which is in the best interest of our learners. Um, and then one, one kind of like quote that I think maybe just kind of sums this up is don't talk about it, be about it, right? We have all these challenges being presented to us during the pandemic, um, during the social conversations that we're having today about racism and everything else. You know, these are the things that are opportunities and do inspire a bit of hope for change for the future. So that's kind of my I think our, our agenda, I shouldn't say my, our agenda that we've been pursuing at the Department of Higher Ed, specifically with our innovation and open education work. Thanks so much. I really appreciate hearing from all three of you and to hear the ways in which you are each thinking about it that have these similarities, but also these differences. Um, it's really, it's really helpful. I do want to apologize to everyone a bit for the technical glitches there with the uh, screen. I know it's not perfect now, but we're going to keep moving forward uh, to that point about agility and responsiveness <laughs> that Spencer just made. So um, I'm going to turn this one um, to Terry for a moment um, and ask, have the effective strategies in generating statewide support for your open education initiative changed? And I'm going to start by saying I think Terry was one of the first states to join the OTN um, with uh, really thinking about open education, I think maybe even five years ago now, Terry, since you joined us. So I'm wondering um, if you can speak a bit about how your strategies have shifted. Sure, thank you. And we've been a happy participant of OTN all these years. So thank you, Sarah. Um, we've really built a lot of community in our state around OER. Um, we have a strong community in, within the academic library um, arena, and this is just another aspect of building community with those participants. But I will say, um, as far as effectiveness, honestly, I think our connection between our members and what we're doing to connect them has been more effective. 
um, the times right for participation in, for example, our OER Commons faculty cohort. Faculty are actively engaging in adapting syllabi and sharing teaching strategies. Everyone's working collaboratively and virtually right now, and they've had this time to reconsider how they teach and deliver services. Um, so I see a great deal of appetite for experimentation at all levels. Um, in terms of how we're supporting the infrastructure of the professional network within the libraries, it's the same thing. Our library community is very interested in professional development and everyone is. We've got a huge turnout for today and in the OTN uh, summit, for example. Emily Frank, our program lead for affordable learning, has taken this heightened interest and really curated, developed, and in some cases, cajoled programming um, out of our membership to meet all this demand. So we're online doing professional development all the time now. Um, and we've also pulled in some ancillary topics related to educational technology and accessibility into our affordable learning program, because I think there's just a high interest um, in those services and in those skill sets. And it's a great opportunity to pitch OER to new audiences coming to learn about those topics. Thanks, Terry. Um, Spencer, can you elaborate a bit? You're at a slightly different place in your program. It would be great to hear from you as well. Yeah, we are in a little bit different place. We haven't been part of the Open Textbook Network quite as long as um, our friends in Louisiana, but I do recall calling our friends in Louisiana and many other states, probably folks on this call, when, when our bill first passed in 2018 and saying, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing, can you help me? And that's one of the things I really value about the Open, open Ed community is that um, we learn together, right? And there's opportunities for, for learning. Uh, one thing that we've done here in the state of Colorado during this past semester in particular was we put it back on our steering committee and we call them the Open Educational Resources Council. They're our statewide steering committee for the Open Education Initiative here in Colorado. They're the experts. They're the subject matter experts. They inform the department and advise the department and the commission, our governing board, on what to do, how to best serve the institutions and therefore best serve the learners of Colorado. Um, what they said was, hey, you know what, we were going to have this conference, you know, by statute, we are required to have um, an annual conference, annual convening, obviously social distance, distancing won't allow for that. So let's rethink some of these resources that we were going to invest in that conference, while also maintaining this community that we're building. Um, so we were able to execute our conference actually as a one day summit online. Um, over 1,200 people registered, and I'm guessing we had about 75% capacity um, for attending the sessions. We had many great speakers, and one of the reasons that we had many great speakers is also due to the opportunities presented by the pandemic. So again, thinking about how people are open-minded and more willing to participate or more, uh, more easily able to participate in a virtual summit than they are in a physical conference, we've played that to our advantage and we were able to have a great successful event, which is a ton of fun as well, um, and help to serve the needs of our educators who are seeking this kind of um, this menu of, of opportunities to, to prof for professional development. And the last thing I'll say is with some of the funds that we did not use for the conference, we used those to address this um, now very pervasive digital divide conversation in our state. We have uh, many institutions that were reaching out to the department saying, it's all well and good, we can throw all of our students on Zoom, but what if they don't have a computer, right? So the OER Council actually reallocated some of the money that they had initially had um, set aside for particular other operations, including the conference, to buy laptops, Chromebooks, and hotspots for students in Colorado to help expand and address that need. And it's an ongoing need. It's something that's evolving all the time. I'm not saying it's a one and done, now we're finished. Uh, but those are the little opportunities that we've presented ourselves to, as Terry mentioned, you know, grabbing those tangentially connected initiatives, online learning, to make sure that we're embedding open education in different parts of everything that we do. 
Bob, would you like to add anything? I know you've had a very busy spring um, in Massachusetts. Uh, if you want to unmute and share anything. Yes, uh, I would. Um, well, first, we too are uh, rookies with o OEN. I'm trying to get into the habit of saying OEN now. <laughs> Hopefully everybody on here knows why I'm saying that. If not, talk to Sarah afterwards. Um, <laughs> our statewide efforts will, will be two years this fall that we've been working at this from a statewide level. We've had campuses. Uh, I think UMass Amherst, for example, has been working on this work going back to 2014. Uh, and other campuses have been doing their own initiatives, but maybe even further back than that, actually, now that I said that. But uh, as a statewide effort, we're still fairly new at this. However, uh, we've done several things. We too have an advisory council that kind of oversees our efforts in, in Massachusetts, and it's made up of a o an o -R -E -O -E -R leader appointed by the president or chancellor from their campus for our 29 public institutions. So that's our community colleges, our four-year state institutions, and the UMass system. And that advisory council is co-chaired by Marilyn Billings, who I know is a person that many of you all in the OTN knows, who's at UMass Amherst, and Susan Tashjen from Northern Essex Community College, which some, many of you probably know, certainly through her work at Triple C O E R. And that effort there, we worked through those folks, both to work within their campuses to increase the and advance the use of OER at their campus level. And then they work upwards across the state to help us look statewide at how we're building our work for OER uh, in terms of influencing the DHE, influencing the Board of Higher Education, influencing the legislature around these issues. I would say probably the biggest strategy shift, of course, has really been delivery, which is going from live meetings to virtual meetings. And, and that has actually worked out very well, I think as many, uh, many of my colleagues have already mentioned, because this great appetite. For example, this spring we offered, in partnership with OTN, or OEN, uh, two faculty o OER training sessions. We had over 700 people in register, over 520 people actually attended the two sessions. Uh, and I remember when we first started talking about this and people thought, oh, I don't know, are people really gonna do this? It's May, it's the end of the semester, it's been a you know, tough spring, people aren't gonna do this. And I kept thinking, no, we pushed everybody into the deep end of the pool and said, do this. So people did what they had to do and you know, some people went to training and did a good job, and a lot of people just did what they had to do. But I think many of them came away thinking, wow, okay, one, that wasn't as bad as I thought, because a lot of people weren't using online before. Two, I could probably do something better than what I just did if I had more time. So I suspected there would be appetite. That 520 people proved me right. There was a great appetite for that training. Subsequently, I should, of course, if we're doing it through OTN, that means they got stipends for coming. So I don't make it sound like they just jumped down. Oh yeah, we're gonna do that. I mean, the stipends help. <laughs> uh, secondly, we did a support staff training and support staff, we mean librarians, instructional designers, uh, teaching and learning center staff in June, two sessions, I had 130 people attend those two sessions, expected to be smaller, but the point was we wanted to make sure the support staff are ready and up to speed so when those faculty members come looking for them they're going to be able to support them so that they actually not just go to the training and write a review but more importantly they actually enact OER in their courses for this fall which is our intent. I'd say the last thing we're doing I mean of course our advisory council and the six committees that make it up have continued to work virtually as part of that strategy. And um, we've been seeking grant funding, which is definitely a, a response to the COVID impact on our work uh, from several sources because, you know, at this point in the fiscal year, our budgeting is totally in the air. We have no idea, like all states, you know, we got a big gap between what the state needs and what they've got. 
Uh, and we don't know yet what that's going to mean for our budgets for this coming year, but we know we need to keep doing this work. So I've been aggressively working to try to find grant funding to ensure we have the funds we need to keep this work going this coming year. So I'd say those are the things that we're doing and we'll continue doing more training, especially if we get that funding, <laughs> the grant funding, we'll continue doing training through the year in education. Great, thank you so much, Bob. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna turn this one to Spencer for a moment. Um, Spencer, you've talked about this a little bit, um, but um, well, you actually talked about it quite a bit in terms of just a general question about how you're keeping open education in mind um, in a lot of priorities, but can you talk a little bit about how does open education fit into the statewide education priorities right now? Sure. Um, and, you know, the, like I mentioned before, it's a question that we continue to ask ourselves. What we've done is we are leveraging the experts that we have in the state. So Bob mentioned, you know, there's campuses, and this is true in Colorado, there's campuses in his state where they've been doing open education work for quite a while. So what we've been doing kind of, and what we did at the outset was find out who those champions are and how they're using open education to meet their goals. And then how do those goals map to the goals of their department, to their institution, and the institutional goals to the state goals? Um, and so what we've been trying to do is map out how open education OER meets different needs and different goals throughout the state. In our state, we have four goals from our master plan um, with one overarching goal. So kind of like five goals that help drive all of the higher ed agenda in public higher ed education here in Colorado. So what we've done is we've nestled ourselves into a couple of those goals to see what role can we play in terms of um, erasing equity gaps? What, what role do we play in terms of fostering innovation, containing costs, you know, all these different things that are essential functions and outcomes that the state is seeing um, and wanting to, to pursue in partnership with the campuses. And the way that we've done that too, kind of over the last couple of years and our intent moving forward for the next couple of years is to, is by a three pronged approach. One, um, the first, the first part of this is building structure. The second is building culture. And the third is building evidence. By building structure, I mean um, funding opportunities at institutions, providing those incentives for faculty to do these reviews, um, helping institutions kind of convey the importance of having this structure at their institution, maybe an OER coordinator, um, conveying that point to administration so that they would invest in that structure. Um, number two, culture. How are we building a culture? Well, it was through things like joining the Open Education Network um, and fostering different opportunities within our state and with other states. You know, recently been talking with other states to, to understand how we might be able to better work together. Um, and, and making more of open education kind of a, a default best practice or maybe an emerging best practice rather than just a, a thing that a group of people do on campus. And then finally, building evidence, what we've been trying to do and what I'm really excited, you know, as we close our first year of our grant program is measuring the progress and the impacts to not only student cost savings, but student learning and other dimensions of student success. And that helps us to quantify and qualify the impacts of open education in Colorado. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been we've been taking on and kind of how it's been mapping to the different needs of the state and to the goals of higher ed in general in Colorado. Thanks, Spencer. Terry, would you like to say anything here, especially in terms of um, the priorities within your state right now? Um, wondering if, if there's any shift there. Well, um, Spencer and I have a commissioner in common, so um, there's a lot of overlap in Louisiana with uh, efforts um, in Colorado there. But I will say that there are a few initiatives that intersect with the work that we're doing in OER, um, or I think we can watch and engage with them. Um, the digital inclusion piece is uh, a great opportunity for us to talk about OER, as um, we've mentioned already. But we have um, already gone ahead and woven that um, 
pursuit of you know further OER support into a digital inclusion strategic action plan. And then our state is pursuing universal access to dual enrollment. And that is um, an expensive proposition on many fronts. So we have a proposal on how OER um, funding and policy could support achievement of universal dual enrollment. And then um, even more recently, adult education has um, been severely impacted by the pandemic. So we're looking now at new connections uh, between what we do with digital literacy for adult ed and our OER initiatives, um, proposing the use of our OER-based OER curriculum for digital literacy, train the trainer curriculum, and just overall trying to uh, further expose people to OER opportunities. Terry, thanks. I'm also so glad you mentioned the non-traditional age students and adult learners. Um, I think that's a, a group that we sometimes aren't paying as much attention to when we're talking about the higher ed environment. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Bob, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I would say the open education absolutely fits into our statewide education priorities. Uh, in December 2019, the Board of Higher Education at the urging of Commissioner Carlos Santiago uh, adopted what we call the equity agenda, uh, which is certainly a movement that's working across the country. And basically we disaggregated our data to look at what's really going on with our student performance and learned that as maybe many suspected, our students of color particularly our Latinx students were doing very, very poorly, yeah, poorly, I won't say very, but poorly relative to white students in performance. The Latinx students' num numbers were going downward. The white students' performance were going upward. Black students were similarly going downward. And, you know, as we have all be learned now during this current crisis, you have to name it what it is. And it's clear that race is a factor going on in performance of students in our system. A, B, given the number of students of color who are in our public higher education system, and C, given how many, 70, 75% of students who attend our public institutions stay in our state, we are absolutely duty bound to ensure those students are being far more successful. So that's really the overarching goal of Department of Higher Education in Massachusetts to address this equity agenda with specific focus on those underserved students. So open education absolutely fits into that and is an important arrow in our quiver to achieve this goal. Because as we know from studies, uh, the data suggests that students who use open education, obviously they get the savings of, of no cost in the first place, certainly no cost, that's our push, or lower costs. But equally important, they have their materials on day one and are able to hit the ground running and therefore have more success in the course and therefore be more persist and then complete. So open education improves quality of the educational experience. It lowers costs, increases student expense, a student success, student success. And that's absolutely mission critical for us. So I, again, the perfect storm, it couldn't happen at a better time because it this has really allowed us to marry this with that work and help to move that equity agenda forward, so. Thank you, Bob. Spencer, did you wanna add something? Yeah, Sarah, I actually wanna pick up on something that both Bob um, and Terry mentioned. So, you know, in, in this land of pandemic opportunity um, <laughs> that, we're all, that we're all facing and we keep talking about, I think more and more pervasive to, and, and maybe we can play this to our advantage in higher ed, is the blending of K-12 and higher ed and work-based learning. All three of those components kind of coming together to, to meet this agenda that we're all trying to meet for large populations um, at, at our state, kind of from our state perspectives. Um, and Terry's right, you know, we, we shared a commissioner, and so maybe some of that vision might overlap with Louisiana, but a lot of the things that Bob was saying also resonated with me in that regard. So. Um, you know, things like making sure that we're providing the, the 
quote unquote non-traditional learner um, the opportunities. I think open education again plays a role there. Um, how about in, in work-based learning? You know, on the job training materials, those can be open, right? Can they not be? Let's collaborate with industry experts to make those OER uh, to help meet, meet the, the needs of the workforce needs. Um, and then another one that Terry mentioned was this, uh, con we call it concurrent enrollment in, in Colorado, but dual enrollment in, in the states, right? That helps to meet many access um, needs in, in different communities. That helps to meet, merit, uh, to contain costs for many students who are trying to pursue that tertiary level of education, but maybe chipping away at the costs during the, their time um, in high school. So. I, I just see a lot of these things kind of coming together with this common thread that we all keep talking about of opportunity. Thanks, Spencer. Oh, pardon me. Okay, so um, asking you to elaborate, uh, Bob, I'll, I'll bring this one to you first, please. Um, what solutions does open education pose for higher ed as we enter into a new era of challenges? I think we've been talking about this throughout um, and I think that focus now on solutions um, is really uh, something I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Cool. Yes. Um, clearly the biggest challenge, as you say, as we enter into the challenge, the biggest challenge, I, at least I see in Massachusetts, is the lack of funding by the state at a period of the greatest need. Um, and just, just because. I mean, again, the, the situation from that COVID has created uh, has, has certainly had a very dire impact on our state. So it, that being said, I think the largest opportunity is the faculty need for robust and engaging materials that would increase student learning. Um, so that's the demand side. Um, it also gives faculty, as we know, greater resource choices to work with, which is certainly one of the things we we're saying to faculty, especially those faculty who concerned about the push to OE, OER and we're, we're saying, listen, this is, this is adds to what you have. It's an additional tool that you have at your, at your, to utilize. And given that this tool also lowers the cost for students, why would you not consider it? Uh, at least explore it, take a look at it. Because uh, as we know, you know, books and supplies are the number three cost driver for students behind tuition and uh, room and board. So um, so I think the solutions it proposes is it supports the online environment in which we will all be living for the foreseeable future. I mean, yes, there'll be some live, but it'll probably be a lot more hybrid and, and online, certainly for this fall and maybe beyond it, depending on what goes on on the, uh, you know, uh, the science part of this work uh, and coming up with uh, a possible uh, solution to address COVID. So given that environment, open education is a critical tool and resource, I believe, that will help us ensure that we're providing quality education to all students, for that matter, as well as lowering costs and giving faculty more resources and tools in which to use to do their jobs. Thanks, Bob. Terry, would you like to add anything? Um, I think it's a great question, and obviously the, the digital divide is front and center right now. Um, and so, you know, back to the access and affordability, we can, we can talk so much about how OER is a solution. The other issue that um, we're all talking about right now is historical gaps and lack of coverage. Um, related to racism and, um, you know, just histories that are not told. And so I see OER for those folks who are not willing to make a whole scale move from a commercial resource, OER is a great opportunity to pull in additional stories um, to make sure that the coverage is complete or more complete of historical context. Spencer, would you like to add anything? Yeah, just briefly, you know, <clears throat> in times of challenge or uncertainty, we often find hope in designating the future generation as a torchbearers of justice or this new world that we're kind of envisioning for everybody to do well, right? Um, so 
you know, I'm not, I'm not unlike anybody else in thinking that like there's hope the future generations will not allow this, you know, whether it's climate change or racism, the things that we're really having these conversations about in our society today, which is really good. Um, how do we empower those future generations? How do we bring them in on the design aspect? You know, it's something that we, I'll be quite frank, haven't done the best job of so far. And so I would challenge us in the state of Colorado, and that's one thing that we intend to do, is to bring those learners into the conversation to say, this is work for you, you help us design it. We don't wanna double back afterwards and say, hey, we've got this thing, it kind of works, does it work for you? Why not bring them in on the front end? And that's something that I think we can do with these conversations that people are now open to. Um, so something that we hope to do in Colorado. Tom. Yeah, I was gonna say, I will just jump off with a comment that Spencer made, which the whole idea about open pedagogy and opportunity to get our student, get voices who have not been engaged in learning and get them more engaged in the learning, both because we want more multiple perspectives that everyone is learning from. And again, the, the studies suggest that having more students in, in having students more engaged increases their engagement with the work and therefore they're more successful, they're more interested, they're more likely to persist and complete, and it ends up making a better quality product for everybody, the students, the faculty, and learning in general. Mm -hmm. Terry, did you want to add anything? I don't think I do, Sarah. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you, Terry, then to stay unmuted. And for our final question um, today is, what do you want people to remember about open education during this challenging time? Well, I'll tell you what I'm worried about. Um, and so it, it's kind of a preparation. It's that so many things are difficult in the shift to um, online and hybrid education and I worry about campuses pressing an easy button and eliminating or hampering the strong OER efforts that are already um, on you know being undertaken on campuses um, with things like inclusive access mandates so that is on my mind right now and I want people to be um, thinking about that, being prepared to discuss the issues, how um, reducing costs um, can benefit students, the, the short gains and the long-term unanticipated consequences. Um, I want people to, you know, really think about how faculty are revising courses to address the shifts in delivery and I really hope that the OEN community is um, taking advantage of all those opportunities. I know we are all pulled in so many directions, um, taking care of our home lives and our children's, and I hope we all have the effort or the energy to take full advantage of this tremendous opportunity in front of us right now. Um, you know, for years we've talked about how to support an OER initiative with no money um, and without grants for faculty course release time. Um, I hope that we get all of those funds for those things, but I see so many opportunities right now um, with people who are ready and willing and may not need the financial um, incentives that they needed in the past. So again, just hoping that people are taking full advantage of this opportunity and that we, um, we rest, but we, you know, we just keep going and taking all of this in. Thanks, Terry. That it really reminds me of that notion of the assumptions. You know, where our assumptions are being challenged, and I appreciate you reminding us also about those assumptions, even about faculty engagement strategies might be different in this in this time. So thank you so much, uh, Spencer. Would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, you know, I just say the power of collaboration. You know, coming together to to address these issues can be helpful for all of us and helps us to be efficient um, with our innovations as well. Um, I like to think of a lot of the work that we're doing is like we're, we're service-based opportunists, right? We see we can connect all these different 
uh, nodes going on in the state and connect and can connect all the different experts and um, how can we accelerate towards those goals and make meaningful progress and um, not only you know survive you know I know these are the hardest times but how can we thrive you know what do we need to thrive Terry I just I really like what you said about hopefully people are are able to take care of themselves because you know it's Maslow's needs right you got to take care of yourselves and, and all your needs before you can take care of others but um, you know we, we want to get to a place where we can thrive and we can do that together and you know place where we're we're looking at each other and looking at all the strengths and talents that we have and and collaborating in a way that is going to move things forward thanks spencer bob thank you sarah um well i think as you said when we opened the session that it uh this is certainly an idea whose time has come i mean i think those in the open movement have always thought its time had come but <laughs> Like all things, you know, you, sometimes you have to wait till the moment strikes. And this is, seems to be the moment that people are recognizing, oh, that open thing, that's what that's all about. Okay, maybe we can take a look at that. So I, I urge everyone to leap on it, leap on it right now because people need it. And it's, you know, there's so such, such a plethora of great resources out there to help people. And, you know, that's the beauty of the OEN strategies to get people to do those reviews, to make them put their toe in the water and look at what's there. And I, can't, I, enjoy, I so enjoy reading those emails when they come back and say, wow, you know, there's some pretty good stuff out there. It's like, yes, <laughs> yes, there is good stuff out there. And you could be using that stuff and save your students a lot of money. So jump on that. So it is absolutely an idea whose time has come. That's certainly one. Uh, I think it offers a cost-effective solution during a perfect storm. That's the second takeaway, I would say. And I love what Spencer said, that it's that doing this work offers opportunities to collaborate on so many levels. I mean, a lot of opportunities for us to collaborate across the state, uh, which helps to break at those silos between our two-year institutions, our four-year institutions, and our UMass. I mean, we have our UMass Medical School who's involved who's a me member of this advisory council and i gotta tell you no knock on the umass medical school which is an excellent medical institution but they don't generally work with most of the inst educational institutions on pretty much anything they can do their own thing and they're on board with this work because they recognize the benefit and value to their educational institution so so we have collaboration across the state and then of course within uh institutions it has great opportunity to bring people together faculty the unions the students the um uh, to work together to improve the quality of education for everybody um and finally i said i would i have to say that open education enables us to address the equity issue which we're all needing to address on our in our institutions especially our public institutions it helps increase student learning which there are more and more studies from University of Georgia to the meta study done by North Dakota State University that talk about the, the impact on student learning and increases affordability, i.e. lowers costs. So this, this is a movement, as all of us know. You gotta jump on it and keep our foot on the gas and keep pushing forward. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate all three of you um, really reminding us not only about those, those silos um, dissolving um, around, you know, um, this kind of content or that kind of content, but it's also a dissolution of that, those silos, you know, around the reasons for OER, you know, this, um, that it's not just about cost, it's also about collaboration, it's also about equity, it's also about tackling those dual enrollments, it's also tackling about those different types of uh, learners. Um, and so I really appreciate the way you all have woven that in here and reminded us of how important it is to think holistically in that way. Um, we are, uh, those are the end of our prepared questions for this panel. I want to thank our panelists so much and offer the opportunity if someone has any questions that they would like to put into the Q&A um, or if there's any questions that want to be expanded on from the Q&A, uh, this is a great time to do that.
Thanks. There is a question I see um, about um, how do I find out if there is an OEN in my state? I know we have OTN, but the P16 collaboration is of great interest to me. Um, that's terrific. Thank you so much. Um, so the Open Education Network, as Karen pointed out um, in the chat today, the Open Textbook Network will be changing our name throughout the summer. Um, to become the Open Education Network. So that is what we mean when we say the OEN there. We're all kind of getting used to using um, that new acronym and new title. Um, so thank you everyone for trying that on with us. Um, and so I think that uh, the P16 collaboration is of great interest to me. Um, it sounds like that's something that's really happening at that state level with each of you. Um, that is not um, the focus of uh, the OEN. Our work has been primarily in the higher education space. Do any of you have a recommendation for how to explore that or learn more about that at the state level? Terry? I, I am not aware of it. Um, I'm going to I'm going to find out about that myself. One one suggestion I was going to have there's a um, there's a few experts out there that would be great to kind of meet with those experts um, as I've been doing and picking their brains. I don't want to throw their name out on this particular chat, but if you send me an email um, again, and I'm Spencer, if you send me an email, I can make an introduction for you, but uh, really I think it's it's on higher ed to familiarize ourselves with what's going on in K-12 and how, how do we play a role? How do we bridge that gap? So that's kind of the approach we've been taking. We actually have some conversations coming up next week um, with, some, with our K-12 agent, state agency who was uh, a recipient of a CARES Act grant that's actually um, or, OER oriented. And so, um, yeah, I would say if we do our research, maybe we can open that door, but I think there's opportunity there. I think we're also, thank you, Spencer. Um, we're also seeing some responses coming through that we'll be putting out, um, especially encouraging people using the U.S. Department of Education's Go Open project as a means to um, exploring that more. Um, I'm going to take uh, one moment and ask a question that came through the chat earlier, but give a uh, Spencer answered it, but I'd like to give Bob and Terry a chance as well. The question was, um, when you discussed encouraging administrators at institutions to invest in OER coordinators, what specifically is your team recommending? Is this a specific position or just a more general sense of giving someone the time to do this work? Um, Bob or Terry or Spencer, you're welcome to elaborate again, um, but this is a question we get asked often. Yeah, I, at this point, I think it's institution by institution, how they handle it. Uh, when we ask them, the presidents and the chancellors of the various ins public institutions to recommend an OER leader to serve on our advisory council, um, they, you know, we recommended people because we had already done our homework to f find out who those people were in their campuses, but it certainly was up to the president and the chances to determine if that's the person they wanted. Most, 98% you know, of them did, but some of them didn't, they recommended other people. And it's a range of folks from, some are librarians, some are um, faculty, I mean, mostly librarians, but some of them are faculty and some are administrators. I suspect, as I think about the group, some of them, OER is their full-time focus at their institution. Uh, many of them, it's part of what they do. So, you know, it really depends on the institution whether they can afford to pay for someone just to focus on OER. The large institution, more likely they can. Smaller ones, people just wear multiple hats because they have to. Um, and, and that's okay. I mean, you know, because one of the things we're certainly encouraging as we are doing at the state by using a team approach, we are encouraging that they are, should be doing that at their campus and bring a group of faculty and students and instructional designers and group together and administrators to work on the things that they're doing because, you know, there's just not enough resources to do everything. So you, you know, let's say it takes a village, right? So create a, create a village and help have those folks to help you to stretch out your tentacles to touch more people. So I think that's 
pretty much what we're doing, seeing happen. And I don't think anything's going to change on that in the near term, given the budgetary constraints. Mm -hmm. Terry, did you want to add something? Sure. And I have to tell you something funny. I was uh, looking at the um, the transcript down here when you asked me about P16, and it said P16 in the transcript. And I said, I have no idea what P16 is. So I was a victim of a bad uh, transcription down here. Um, but to the other question, um, we, uh, we have we have worked under the framework of there being a central point person at each of the campuses who is our uh, primary person that we communicate with about our um, OER efforts. Recently, we challenged that assumption and asked our deans and directors about how they are covering the need for OER support within the library. And this past year when they answered that, um, they let us know that they are supporting it through multiple people at this point, that the need to support OER in many cases has grown beyond uh, one individual and that we're seeing lots of models with subject liaisons, um, it just incorporating that as an ongoing part of the way that they work with faculty. And I think that's a really healthy approach. Certainly there's a need for a point person when we're talking about data collection and monitoring investments and outcomes, but day to day, um, I'm so pleased to see that it is just what we do now. Thank you. Um, I will point out in chat um, that we did share a folder that includes the OER job descriptions. If you are going to take a more focused um, approach to the OER job um, positions, there is a folder of job descriptions. And I would say that there's lots of material in there that also could be, um, if it is something that's integrated into multiple people's um, job for whatever reason, um, moving forward, there's lots of language in those different job descriptions to pull from. Um, I'd like to take a moment and thank Bob, Terry, and Spencer um, for um, incredible contributions today. It's been really wonderful to hear from you. Um, I want to apologize for some of the technical glitches on our end with the slides. My apologies to you attendees. Um, and we are just coming up on time now. Um, so this session has been recorded and will be able to be viewed on um, YouTube. Um, and we hope that you will join us at um, the other OTN Summit sessions uh, coming up for the rest of the week. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.